chyle is a white milky fluid that flows in the lymphatic system from the lacteals of the small intestine to the end of the thoracic duct. It consists of lymph collected from the lower extremities and left upper quadrant of the body, and lipids and fat-soluble vitamins obtained from the diet. Under normal circumstances, chyle passes through the thoracic duct and into the bloodstream. However, if any of the lymphatic vessels it flows through are damaged, a chyle leak can occur and it can accumulate in the thoracic or abdominal cavity. This video begins with a brief review of the lymphatic system and the composition of chyle, then it examines a chyle leak by looking at common etiologies, potential consequences, and conservative management with an emphasis on medical nutrition therapy. The lymphatic system features a complex network of vessels that drain excess interstitial fluid and return the contents of it to the bloodstream, transport lipids and fat-soluble vitamins from the small intestine to the bloodstream, and transport lymphocytes and participate in the activation of an immune response. As such, a general function of the lymphatic system is to carry and recycle nutrients and cells that are essential to life. When it's just the contents of the interstitial fluid and lymphocytes, the fluid that travels in the lymphatic vessels is called lymph. Then when you include the lipids and fat-soluble vitamins from the small intestine, it's called chyle. Since interstitial fluid exists outside of the cells of tissues, lymph is found in lymphatic vessels throughout the body. Meanwhile, chyle is only found in the lymphatic vessels between the lacteals of the small intestine and the end of the thoracic duct. The lipids, which are carried in the lymphatic system as chylomicrons, give chyle its white color and milky appearance. Without the lipids, contents of the lymphatic vessels tend to be colorless and clear. Now that we've explored the functions of the lymphatic system and distinguished chyle from lymph, we're going to look a bit closer at the composition of chyle. Even though data for the composition of chyle is limited, the fact that it's derived from interstitial fluid and chylomicrons is revealing. As mentioned previously, interstitial fluid exists outside of the cells of tissues. It provides a way to deliver contents of blood plasma to individual cells, while also collecting cellular waste that's produced as a byproduct of metabolism. It's mostly made up of water, which serves as a solvent for nutrients like electrolytes, glucose, amino acids, and fatty acids, proteins like albumin, globulin, and fibrinogen, and other vitamins and minerals. When it comes to chylomicrons, they're formed in the intestinal cells as a way to get fat-soluble nutrients into circulation, and they're composed of triglycerides, cholesterol, phospholipids, and protein. Add in fat-soluble vitamins obtained from the diet, lymphocytes, and a small number of erythrocytes, and that completes the general makeup. Reports of the total volume of chyle that passes through the thoracic duct are anywhere from 2 to 4 liters per day. This volume changes based on factors like fat intake, fluid intake, and physical activity. A high fat intake leads to more chyle output than a low fat intake or fasting, a high fluid intake leads to more chyle output than a low fluid intake or fasting, and physical activity leads to more chyle output than bed rest. If you're enjoying this video so far, make sure you check out the companion piece, which you can download by following the link in the video description. A chyle leak occurs when one of the lymphatic vessels carrying it is damaged. This is usually the thoracic duct, which originates at the lumbar spine and empties into the junction of the left subclavian and internal jugular veins, though there are anatomic variations. The common etiologies can be broadly categorized as traumatic and non-traumatic. Under traumatic causes, some are iatrogenic, meaning they happen unintentionally during a medical examination or treatment. This includes head and neck surgery, thoracic surgery, and abdominal surgery. Other causes are non-iatrogenic, like a forceful blow, knife wound, or gunshot wound to the chest or abdomen, and emesis or coughing. Under non-traumatic etiologies, there's malignancy such as lymphoma or lung cancer, other diseases like sarcoidosis, amyloidosis, cirrhosis, and heart failure, and cases that are idiopathic, meaning they have no known cause. 
As a clinical dietitian working in the acute care setting, I find a chyle leak happens most often as a postoperative complication of surgery. Considering the composition of chyle, you can see how a chyle leak is problematic. Losing a significant amount of chyle can result in dehydration from the loss of fluid and electrolytes, an energy deficit from the loss of glucose, amino acids, fatty acids, and chylomicrons, micronutrient deficiencies from the loss of vitamins and minerals, immunosuppression from the loss of lymphocytes, and poor wound healing if the nutrient-rich fluid is in contact with the surgical site. Furthermore, depending on where the leak transpires, chyle can accumulate in the thoracic or abdominal cavity. The most common location this takes place is the pleural space and the peritoneum, resulting in a chylothorax and chylocytes respectively. Chyle in either of these locations can compress and impair the function of the organs they surround. At a minimum, this will cause uncomfortable symptoms like shortness of breath. The procedures to drain it may be painful, and they come with risks like internal bleeding and organ perforation. In order to prevent these complications, a chyle leak must be met with swift action by the interdisciplinary team. While surgical repair of the lymphatic system is sometimes necessary, a chyle leak can frequently be treated with a modified diet or enteral feeds, parenteral nutrition, medication, and or bed rest. Thus, a chyle leak presents the dietitian with an opportunity to play a crucial role. With nutritional management, the goal is to reduce the flow of chyle to promote spontaneous closure of the leak and minimize risk of dehydration, weight loss, and micronutrient deficiencies. Unfortunately, there are no consensus guidelines disseminated by a professional organization that a majority of clinicians follow. This can be partly attributed to an overall lack of high-quality research. There are few, if any, randomized controlled trials on this topic, and most of the available literature comes from case reports and retrospective observational studies. The interventions employed are therefore generally left up to the policy of the individual medical institution or the judgment of an individual physician. With that being said, options for nutrition therapy include the following. A diet with as little fat as possible, enteral feeds with as little fat as possible, parenteral nutrition with no diet or enteral feeds, and some combination of a low-fat diet or enteral feeds, and parenteral nutrition. The decision on which to provide is typically made based on the measured volume of chyle that is leaking per day. The higher the chyle output, the less likely the patient will eat or receive enteral feeds, and the more likely they'll be given parenteral nutrition. A common threshold that's used is 1,000 milliliters per day, and enteral feeds are only given if the patient is unable to eat by mouth. To further illustrate how this decision is made, I thought it would be instructive to highlight a prospective study published in 2017 by Weiss et al. This study took patients who developed a chyle leak after an esophagectomy and put them through a simple algorithm to determine the nutrition therapy they would receive. Patients with an initial chyle output of less than 500 milliliters per day were started on a low-fat diet or enteral feeds for 7 days. If the output stopped after 7 days, the low-fat restriction was lifted. If the output persisted or increased during the 7 days, the diet or enteral infusion was stopped and the patient was transitioned to parenteral nutrition. Patients with an initial output of greater than 1,000 milliliters per day were not given a diet or enteral feeds and were started on parenteral nutrition for 7 days instead. If the output was decreased after 7 days, the patient was transitioned to a low-fat diet or enteral feeds until it stopped. If the output persisted or increased during the 7 days, the patient underwent surgical repair. Any patient who had an initial output of 500 to 1000 milliliters per day underwent further assessment to see if the output was increasing or decreasing. Patients with decreasing output went into the less than 500 milliliter pathway and received a low fat diet or enteral feeds. Patients with increasing output went into the greater than 1,000 milliliter pathway and received parenteral nutrition. At the end of the study period, a total of 61 patients were started on the low-fat diet or enteral feeds, and 15 were started on parenteral nutrition. 
Of the 61 patients who started on the low-fat diet or enteral feeds, 40 of them were cured without needing to be transitioned to parenteral nutrition. One patient died from complications of acute respiratory distress syndrome, but out of the remaining 20 patients, 17 patients were cured after going on parenteral nutrition, and only 3 went on to have surgery. For the 15 patients who went straight to parenteral nutrition, 11 of them were cured without surgery. This study shows that conservative management with medical nutrition therapy is an effective tool for managing a chyle leak in this population. The algorithm serves as a model for future research, and I feel that it, or something similar, should be considered for use by clinicians. As an aside, in my experience, physicians will normally allow diet advancement before a set number of days if the chyle output becomes minimal or stops. One issue I have with the study by Weiss et al. is that there are no details given for the low-fat diet or enteral feeds. In other words, I want to know how low low-fat was for those patients. This seems to be a gap in the body of evidence, as no maximum amount of fat has been identified, and patients are simply expected to consume as little fat as possible. Nevertheless, one number I've seen mentioned in resources like UpToDate is less than 10 grams per day, and we've started to recommend this to patients where I practice. Please note that this is a significant restriction, and it's not satisfied by most low-fat diet restrictions in hospitals. So, before ordering any diet, it's imperative to understand exactly how much fat it contains. The Kyle diet we've established provides less than 5 grams of fat and approximately 85 grams of protein per day. Here's what a sample day looks like. Breakfast consists of cold cereal with skim milk, fat-free yogurt, fresh fruit, and black coffee. Lunch consists of white rice, steamed vegetables, vegetable broth, fat-free yogurt, and fresh fruit. Dinner consists of steamed sole, steamed vegetables, mashed potatoes made with no milk or butter, and skim milk. We also place an order for four bottles of Ensure Clear, and these can be consumed at any point during the day. As you can see, the food selections are limited, but so are the number of days the patient will be expected to be on it. You never want to restrict fat to this degree for greater than 7 to 10 days. This is because you increase the risk of a prolonged energy deficit, essential fatty acid deficiency, and a fat-soluble vitamin deficiency. Similar to the issue with ordering a low-fat diet, the low-fat tube feeding formulas that most institutions have on their formulary are inappropriate for a chyle leak. Patients with a chyle leak need to be placed on a specialty formula, which very few institutions keep in stock since it's considered a rare event. The only tube feeding formula I'm aware of that's appropriate for use with a Kyleek is Nestle's product Vivanex RTF, and it contains 11.5 grams of fat per liter. Compare that to Nestle's Replete at 34 grams per liter, and Abbott's Vital HP at 23.2 grams per liter, which are the lowest in fat for formulas that a majority of hospitals keep in stock. If Vivanex isn't available, or there's a delay due to the need for it to be shipped to the facility, a fat-free oral supplement like Ensure Clear or Boost Breeze can be safely administered through a feeding tube. However, I find these products are too low in protein and too high in carbohydrate to be a sustainable alternative, and always need to be paired with a protein modular. Finally, for patients who are placed on parenteral nutrition, there should be no unique restriction on the provision of an intravenous lipid emulsion. This is because intravenous administration bypasses the body's need to package lipids as chylomicrons and transport them in the lymphatic system. Essentially, these patients are treated just like any other patient on parenteral nutrition. You can see all the videos I've published on parenteral nutrition by clicking the link at the top right corner of your screen. The last section of this video is going to look at dietary supplements. The number one dietary supplement that's given to patients with a Kyleek is medium chain triglycerides, or MCT, which is often ingested as MCT oil. These serve as a concentrated source of energy when the diet or tube feeding formula is mostly carbohydrate and protein. 
they're acceptable with the chyle leak because they get absorbed directly into the bloodstream via the hepatic portal vein. MCT oil provides approximately 230 calories per ounce. It's not very palatable, so patients may need to mix it with juice, skim milk, coffee, applesauce, or hot cereal. In addition to this, it occasionally contributes to gastrointestinal distress, so I wouldn't start with more than one ounce given three times per day. A major limitation of MCT oil is that it doesn't provide essential fatty acids or fat-soluble vitamins. Thus, it can't be considered a solution for a patient who requires prolonged fat restriction or displays signs of deficiency. Beyond MCT, the only other dietary supplements that receive attention are vitamins and minerals. With the relatively short amount of time that fat is restricted with the diet or enteral feeds, routine supplementation with intravenous micronutrients isn't recommended. In most cases, a standard multivitamin and multimineral tablet or oral suspension suffices. Patients who are placed on parenteral nutrition can receive the standard dose of 10 milliliters of a multivitamin solution and 1 milliliter of a multi-trace element solution. For monitoring, close attention should be paid to any signs or symptoms of a specific vitamin or mineral deficiency. There's no need to check laboratory measurements unless there are concerning signs or symptoms, or the patient has a very poor nutritional status when the chyle leak occurs. In the end, a chyle leak is a rare event that you're not going to encounter every day or month in the acute care setting. Still, considering the threat it poses to the health and safety of the patient, it's something that all clinicians must be prepared to handle. By following the concepts for conservative management outlined in this video, you should be able to create a plan that's implemented with speed and efficiency and is effective for treating the condition. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and download the companion piece by following the link in the video description.